tour of modernism through the Met. Good morning and welcome to the Metropolitan Museum. My name is Sophia and I'll be your guide for today's tour. Before we begin, I'd like to tell you about the history of this beautiful museum. The Met was built on April 13, 1870 and opened to the public in 1872. Its architectural style is Beaux Arts, which was inspired by the grandness and classical influences from the Greek and Roman eras. Much of the building is built with limestone and marble features, and the inside of the museum is brightly lit by the natural light due to the long windows that go along the walls. In 1880, the, the Metropolitan Museum moved to its current site in Central Park. American citizens wanted Central Park to be a cultural showpiece as well as a pastoral retreat. Their goal was to bring art and education to the American people. It's huge and the biggest museum in America, housing over 1.5 million artworks. So I've constructed a plan to get a chance to look at artworks from three collections from the modern art movement, which include Impressionism, Pop Art and Cubism. Today we'll be exploring three artists who changed the Western art world through their artworks and painting styles. Before we begin the initial tour, I would like to explain what modernism is and how it affected the world of art. Modernism brought plenty of new techniques such as new brush strokes and use of different colours and materials, but first and foremost how the artists wanted to express themselves. In the 1960s, modernism took its place in the modern world and became a key idea in the art world. Enough chatter from me, let's get started. First, we will visit room 774, which is where all the Impressionism artworks are located. Impressionism was a movement that had started in France in 1860 and was defined by desire to capture the moment's visual impression, particularly in terms of the way light and colour were changing. Key artists include Pissarro, Monet and Sicily. New perspectives and understandings of the world were made possible by the camera. Artists started experimenting with non-traditional angles, compositions and frames that were influenced by photography. The emergence of movements like surrealism and cubism, which aim to portray various disabilities and culture blind with aided by this movement. He painted the hillside pastures September in 1922. It is 66 by 73.3 centimetres and Metcalf used oil and canvas, which is a method of painting involving the procedure of painting with pigment with a medium of drying oil as the binder or as the bound. Binder. Willard Metcalf was born 1st of July 1858 in Lowell, Massachusetts. Metcalf's parents, who were also drawn to the arts, saw their son's potential early on and supported his appropriate training. Metcalf was also the first student to be awarded a scholarship to the Museum of Fine Arts School, which he attended from 1877 to 1878. Furthermore, he also attended evening life painting lessons at the Lowell Institute. Metcalf used oil paints because of its rich colours and its ability to seamlessly blend in. Like other Impressionists, Metcalf would have likely painted in plain air or outdoors to capture the effects of natural light and atmosphere directly from nature. He would have carefully observed the landscape, noting the colours, shapes and nuances of the scene. Metcalf embraced plain air painting, which entailed creating paintings outside straight from nature, much like the French Impressionists did. This gave him the ability to pick the light and atmosphere's effects with the spontaneity and immediateness that characterise Impressionist work. There are many ways that Metcalf could have made the painting, but he most likely started by studying the landscape and doing sketches. He was better able to comprehend the scene's composition, lighting and general atmosphere thanks to these rough sketches. Once the sketches were complete, he would have painted the picture layer by layer, starting in the backdrop and moving towards the foreground. It's possible that he combined palette, knife and brushwork methods to provide depth and texture to the scene. Metcalf would have signed and varnished the painting after he was happy with it, readying it for display and purchase. Hillside Pastures, September, conveys a timeless admiration for the splendour of the natural world and serenity that can be found in uncomplicated time spent in reflection. It embodies the idea frequently associated with the Impressionist movement of capturing the true yet significant movements of life, inviting viewers to pause, ponder and take comfort in the peace of the countryside. Regarding symbols, the painting's background, which is an enormous sky, can stand for immensity, liberty and limitless possibilities. It emphasises the sense of openness and expansiveness that is inherent in the environment and provides a backdrop to the serene site below. We will now be visiting the Cubism section of the museum, which is where our next artwork is kept. 
Cubism was a groundbreaking new method of depicting reality that was developed in the years 1907 to 1908 by the artist Pablo Picasso and Jules Braque. They combined various points of view on the same subjects, usually objects and figures, producing paintings that seem fractured and abstracted. Cubism is the notion that art can evaluate nature or that creators to use conventional perspective, modelling and foreshortening techniques was rejected by Cubist painters. Rather, they aim to draw attention to the canvas's two dimensions, thus they reduced and shattered objects into geometric shapes, which they then rearranged into space that was shallow and relief-like. Additionally, they employed several or opposing points of view. Our next artist is Paul Klee, who was a Swiss-born German artist. His highly individual style was influenced by movements in art that included Expressionism, Cubism and Surrealism. The main emphasis on Klee's academic training was on his sketching abilities. Before joining German symbolist Frank von Struck workshop in 1900, he studied for two years in a private setting. In 1920, Klee created the Temple Gardens that measured 23.8 times 30.2 centimetres. Where he used gouache and traces of ink on three sheets of paper mounted on paper mounted on cardboard. Gouache is an opaque watercolour that is made of natural pigment, water, a binding agent, and occasionally extra inert substance. The tin depicts a fantastical landscape with a series of geometric shapes and patterns arranged in a dynamic composition. Klee occasionally enjoyed using scissors to rework his works, he may have divided the piece into three parts and shifted the central one to the left because he felt the piece appeared too symmetrical in this instance. The location shown in Temple Gardens, which is previously just delightfully full of the angles and corners he had described. Temple Gardens was inspired by Klee's visit to Tanzania in April 1914. The watercolour has the brilliance of stained glass window on a sunny day. Stairways lead to the doors of various garden pavilions palm trees and peak over sections of high walls and dome towers are here and though there might not be a clear connection between temple gardens and the impressionist movement Klee was influenced by a wide range of artistic trends and styles just like many other painters of his era still his art is usually regarded as belonging more to the larger modernist style than to impressionism in particular the temple gardens alludes to a relationship between architecture and the natural world the artwork might examine how the natural environment and man-made structures interact, maybe pointing to a synthesis or peaceful cohabitation of the two. One could consider the title itself to be a symbolic component, temple, can conjure images or worship, spirituality or holiness, whereas gardens might represent development, rebirth or the natural world. Our final part of the tour is the pop art area, where we will find out more about pop art. Pop art is a British and American art trend that is first appeared in the middle and late 1950s. A fascination with mass media imagery, materialism and popular culture defined it. Pop artists frequently included elements of mass culture, such as advertising, comic books, product packaging and other components into their artwork. Several artists were crucial to the growth and popularity of pop art. To name a few, Andy Warhol and Tom Wesselman. Pop art celebrated consumer culture, mass production, and everyday objects, often depicting familiar items like soup cans, soda bottles, and comic book characters. Consumer culture flourished in the years following World War II, especially in Western nations like the United States and the United Kingdom. Pop art emerged as a result of the expanding economy and rising consumption, displaying mass produced graphics and common consumer goods. The final artist that we will be looking at is Andy Warhol. He explored themes of celebrity culture and the widespread use of mass media imagery were frequently explored in Warhol's artwork. He blurred the distinctions between great art and popular culture by painting iconic portraits of stars like Elizabeth Taylor, Elvis Presley and Marilyn Monroe. Created in 1962, Warhol's series of paintings with Campbell's soup cans is among his most well-known pieces. These paintings, which combine several pictures of Campbell's soup cans, are praised by their audacity and minimalism that have come to represent the pop art trend. But that's not the piece that we'll be looking at today. Today we'll be looking at Mona Lisa, painted 1963 and measures by 111.8 cm x 73.7 cm. Warhol used acrylic on silk screen on canvas. For an artist like Warhol, 
who frequently produced large-scale commercial works, silk screen printing and acrylic paint are reasonably accessible and reasonably priced materials. He was able to produce work using these materials that were both aesthetically pleasing and profitable. But how does Warhol create his work? Typically, Warhol drew inspiration for his silk screen prints from pre-existing images. He most likely used a print, magazine, or book to obtain a copy of Leonardo da Vinci's well-known painting from the Mona Lisa. Printing can start as soon as the silk screen is ready. Warhol would ink the top of the silk screen after putting a canvas or piece of paper underneath it. The image is made by pushing ink through the gaps of the screen with a squidgy and onto the surface underneath. Warhol might have manually added further features or decorations to the image after it was printed. To further personalise the work, he may do things like add brush strokes, splatter paint, or apply other mixed media components. Warhol was able to create many different versions of the Mona Lisa using silk screen printing, each with its own unique style and while keeping the famous images of the original painting. Using celebrity culture references, Warhol's representation of the Mona Lisa fits within his larger look into the cult of popularity in modern society. Warhol blurs the distinction between high and low culture and challenges viewers to reevaluate the meaning and revalence of the original artwork by taking an iconic image from art history and reinterpreting it into his own lens. The pop-up movement by Andy Warhol and Impressionism have a similar significant influence on modern art and culture. Following movements and artistic breakthroughs were made possible by their concentration on betraying the essence of modern life and questioning conventional rules of art. Although there may not be a clear connection between Impressionism and Andy Warhol's Mona Lisa, there are subject and logical similarities between his work and the concepts and that Impressionist paintings explored. Warhol's version of the Mona Lisa reveals his openness to experimenting with fresh materials and methods for his artwork. By incorporating popular culture and mass media into his artwork, Warhol broke down the barriers between traditional artistic practice and laid the groundwork for later movements and advancements in contemporary art. Pop art is sometimes linked to practice of artistic appropriation, which is demonstrated by Warhol's exchange of the Mona Lisa. Warhol blurs the distinction between originality, limitation, and raises issues regarding the nature of creative creativity by taking pre-existing images from popular culture and reconsidering them into his art. Thank you for visiting the map.